John 3, 14. The divine text says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. The Gospel of John is not one of the synoptic Gospels. The Gospel of John is like the Apostle Paul. They like to exclude him. As I've been teaching in the Sunday school, there's an element out there, has been for a long time, that would like to get rid of the Apostle Paul and the Pauline epistles that he put in the New Testament. There are those that would like to get rid of the Gospel of John. They pit it against the so-called synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us a synopsis. In other words, a one view of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Gospel of John is different. It talks about the same one, but it talks about him in a little different way. The reason it does is because the Gospel of John was written probably long after the Jewish kingdom and the Jewish Messiah had been rejected. The Gospel of John was written, therefore, to reach out into an unbelieving world. That's why it says time and time again, these things are written that you might believe, and believing, having everlasting life. Somebody say to me, preacher, how in the world can a man's life, future, fortune, his eternity, and everything there is about him be based upon one simple thing that he believes? But you see the New Testament belief that's used in the Gospel of John goes much deeper, reaches much further, embraces far more than simply agreeing to facts. The belief in the New Testament is embracing someone. It's reaching out to them. It's pulling them into your life. It's taking hold of them in despair. It's saying to them, I need you. I want you. You've got to save me, for there is no other Savior. I'm lost and I'm hell bound. God have mercy on my soul. That New Testament belief is a powerful thing, for it has changed the life of countless millions for the last 2,000 years, and indeed will change the lives of many more to our Lord Jesus Christ comes. But I'm gonna call your attention to John chapter number three, where the Lord Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, who was well versed in the book of Numbers and knew exactly what he was referring to when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Here was a reference clear as it could be to the coming crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was crucified on the cross as a historic fact recorded in the word of the living God. Why did he have to go to Calvary? In the book of Numbers it says that they begin to complain and murmur. They begin to cry out unto Moses and say, what did God bring us up out of Egypt for to die in the wilderness? Our soul loatheth this light bread. And when you look at that and you begin to think, what did they say? Were not they hungry? And did not God send the manna from heaven? And did not he tell them in John chapter number six that that manna that came down from heaven was a picture of his body that was gonna be taken to the cross and there die for them? Did not they therefore despise the gift of God, the Lord Jesus Christ? Did not they speak against something that was very spiritual, that spoke to the very need of their soul and said, our soul loatheth this light bread? God said, all right, if you're tired of light bread, I'll send you the opposite. If you're tired of the life-giving bread that came down from heaven, if you're tired of living, I'll let you die. And the Bible said he sent fiery serpents into their midst. And the Bible said the fiery serpent began to bite them. And the scripture said when the fiery serpent bit them, that they went into this agony and they eventually died. They died from the bite of a fiery serpent. Death was all around them. Death was everywhere. They, lie, they saw death in all of its forms. They lost their mothers and they lost their fathers. They lost their children. They lost their loved ones. And they stood about death all around them. And they cried into Moses, Oh God, help us, they said. And so Moses cried out to God. 
And God said, take a brazen, ser brazen serpent and put it on a pole and raise it up into the air. And so when one is bitten, they don't have to touch it. They don't have to be able to get to it. They don't have to understand it. They don't have to tell anybody else about it. All they've got to do is look up to it. And when they look up to it, they'll be healed. They'll be made well. It's as simple as it can be. Look and live. Look and live. Look and live. In the Old Testament, there was a baby lying out in the field. That baby apparently had been born. No one cared for it and left it lying in its own blood. The Bible said one walked by. It was God. He saw the baby lying in the field. And he said to that baby, live. He just said a word, live. He just spoke a command, live. But in that command was the whole power of God. In that word was the ability to raise the dead. In that word was the power to save a soul. In that word, it was the word of the living God that upholds all things by the word of his power. It's the salvation word. It simply says, look and live. When God speaks, his word will fulfill everything that God intends for it to do. It shall not return unto him void, but it'll accomplish that which he pleases and prosper in the thing whereto he hath sent it. I send you forth that word this morning. I want you to hear it loud and clear. If you'll look to Jesus, you can live. I'll hear the command that comes forth from his mouth. He said to that baby, live. The baby didn't have to answer. The baby didn't have to clean itself up. The baby didn't have any ability to do anything, but receive what God said. And I say to you today, receive what he said. I'm simply a messenger, but the word that goes forth in this house today is the saving word of Almighty God. All week long, I thought I knew what I would be preaching today. But in my prayer closet yesterday, heaven went silent. I could feel the silence. And I said, Lord, I don't like this. I don't like this one bit. God, I can't take that. I'll not leave this. I will not leave this closet until I've heard from you, till I feel your presence in my soul. I will not walk out and see the sun rise another day till I know that God is moving in my heart. I'll not walk out that building right there until I know that I know that I know that my Savior is moving in my soul and I have His Spirit alive in me. And He said, I want you to change your message, son. I said, tell me what you want me to preach. I'll preach anything you want to preach. He said, preach the cross. Preach the cross tomorrow morning for somebody's going to be there that needs to hear what you're going to say. So I don't know who you are, but I want you to know that God told me before you ever came in this house today, He told me what to preach today. He told me to preach the cross. He told me to preach the cross. The Bible said, the, the apostle said, I will glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ to the whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The cross is a dividing line. It's a measuring rod. It's a temperature taker. It's something, my friend, that you can't ignore. You've got to deal with it. The cross was a spectacle. I always put it outside the city where people could see it next to a major road. It was the Roman form of execution. It was something to shame people, but it was also there to strike fear into their heart and into their soul. When you see a person hang on a cross, they could hang there for days. They could hang there and the birds would come and peck away at them. People would throw all kinds of stuff against their bodies. They became a spectacle that was a hideous sight indeed because they were dying on a cross. And the Roman institution of the crucifixion, it worked its way. It worked its its purpose for people feared and that's what Rome wanted they wanted people to fear because they saw what happened when they were crucified on a cross and so the Lord Jesus Christ the Bible said became obedient unto death even the death of the cross and he humbled himself his humility was in service to the father he gave him everything that he had and the final thing that he gave was his very life upon the cross it was there that he looked down upon his tormentors and said father forgive them for they know not what they do it was at the cross the bible says that god was in christ reconciling the world unto himself god imputing the trespasses unto them and committed to us the ministry of reconciliation my friend the cross is so important in your life because it bears upon your life it bears upon the way you live it controls who you are the apostle paul says i came knowing nothing among you but jesus christ and him crucified he could have known a lot of things but the church has got away from the cross the church preaches everything in the world to people when they come into it today but the cross but you can't be saved apart from the cross it was on the tree that he bore the judgment of god the bible says that by his stripes we were healed peter says that in his own body bore our sins 
in his body on the cross. So my Lord Jesus Christ on the tree took not only the judgment of God, but he took the hatred of men. He took the vile corruption of this world. He got as low as you could get. My friend, I want you to understand something this morning. Some of you have been dealing with religion. You've tried self-help programs. You've been into positive movements. You've probably been, maybe even been part of this emerging church. You've been to churches where the minute you walk through the door, it's a rock beat and it's a, it's a physical thing that stirs you and stirs your flesh. And then when you left there, you felt good about yourself, but yourself hadn't changed. You know you're still the same old person. You know you're still haunted by the same old sins. And you don't want to tell anybody about it, but you still have the same fears. Some of you in this house today, the fear of dying terrifies you. You have no idea what lies beyond the grave. You know that there's no power in your life. You say there's a man upstairs and you believe in a few holidays through the year. Maybe Easter, maybe Christmas, maybe Mother's Day. You come by the church, but as far as knowing the Lord, you don't know a single thing about him. I want you to hear something this morning. Live. I want you to hear something today. Look. I want you to understand there's nothing you can do. We don't want your money. We don't want penance. We don't want you praying to saints. We don't want you offering anything up and give anything. We want nothing from you. What you need to do today is the only thing you can do is to look to that cross that I'm going to be preaching to you and preaching about right now. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is something that the church of God is proud of. So what do you mean proud? I'm proud of the one who went to the cross. I'm not proud of men who nailed him to the tree. I'm not proud of the cross as far as a piece of wood is concerned, but I'm proud of what it represents. I want you to know the world is crucified to me through that cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. But of all the things the cross is, and it's a lot of things, it was the place where the Bible says that he nailed to the tree all of these ordinances against us. It was there at the cross that the demons, the Bible says, in the Old Testament scripture, they're called the bulls of Bashan. They gathered around him. There is no way that any of us can know what he endured spiritually while he was hanging on the tree, the voices he heard, the condemnation that fell upon him, and the final act was when heaven itself, when God Almighty turned his back on his son, and the heavens became dark as brass, and he cried out in the midst of that darkness. Nothing could be heard but this one cry. Makes no difference where you were standing or what you saw. My friend, it was total thick darkness, but piercing through that darkness was this cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We'll never understand the dregs that he drank. We'll understand, never understand the depth of the sorrow of his suffering. But I want you to know one thing and I want you to know it well. It was there at that cross that consummated all of the human feelings that a person would ever have. All of the fears and the sorrows that we would ever endure in this world. All of the hell that we would ever have to go through. All that we would have to endure as sinners. And the, and the pain that sin brings into our lives and the destruction that it brings, the homes that it destroys. It was there at that cross the Lord Jesus Christ drank that cup and it took, drank it to its feet, to, he emptied it to its dregs. He emptied it at the cross. Why did he do that? Because he can minister to you now through this living word. This word that I'm preaching to you, this word that's coming forth from this preacher right now. I want you to understand something. What I'm saying to you is not my word, it is the word of God. And if you can look, and if you can look up and simply live, this word will change you. It will bring to you the change that you need. It will be a seed implanted in your soul. You can start it by simply receiving the engrafted word. Receive that seed. Take upon it. Re re take hold of it. And say, Lord God, I may not understand this, but I believe it. I'm going to receive it. I want your help. I need you in my life. A lost man tries everything that he can sometimes when he comes under conviction and realizes what a sorry dog he is. He'll try everything he possibly can to make himself better, to do better, to be better to people, to turn over a new leaf and do what he can to do that. And he does that because it's the effort of the flesh to do it without allowing himself to be spoken to by God. Would you listen to me? God can speak to you deeper and further and greater 
than you have ever heard from him even to this day in your life. Since I had this episode come into my life, he has begun to take me to places I didn't even know existed. He's begun to show me things about myself I didn't even know was there. He's beginning to make spiritual truths real to me in comparative form that I'm beginning to understand now. Stuff that I've been preaching for 36 years. I've preached over 4,000 times. I've stood up here in this pulpit and preached 4,000 times. And yet I'm like a little baby in that closet talking to God, showing me things about myself I didn't even know existed. He has to get your attention. Then he has to be able to speak to you and get you to where you'll listen to what he's got to say to you. You need help. You do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do. Everybody in this house needs help. But you got your religious wall thrown up in front of him and you filter everything through all your religious cliches and you judge God by your experience. God's greater than your experience. He knows more than you know. You'll live your Christian life according to the way you understand God and you can figure Him out. Then take all the credit for it. Why don't you get on your face and say, God, I'm a little baby. I don't know anything. I want you to teach me, show me, explain to me what I need. We try to reach people for the Lord. We witness to them and we teach and we minister and this is all good. But the truth of the matter is, your relationship with God is not built on some formula. Just because somebody got down next to you and prayed some sinner's prayer with you, or quote unquote led you to the Lord, doesn't mean you have a clue who He is. This relationship with God goes much, much deeper than that. There are you sitting here right now in this house, you would never confess to another human being the fears that you have. You would never confess to another human being some of the stuff you've done. You would never confess to another human being the wickedness that you feel sometimes rise up in your soul. And just because another human being comes along and says, let me show you the way, they may not even know the way themselves. This God that we serve, He's greater than us. He's bigger than us. He's more powerful than us. And when I preach the cross to you, I'm telling you that's the way. I'm telling you that cross where the Lord Jesus Christ went and died and suffered for us, that's the way. And let me tell you what that way is. It's a love letter. The cross is a love letter. Let me tell you something about love. Some of you grew up in homes where you had a mother and a father that loved you. And that mother and father that loved you, you know what that feels like. You feel it. You understand it. You've got it. You have it. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I don't know anything about that. I grew up in a dog fight. I grew up in a place where they busted beer bottles on the side of tables and shoved them up under somebody's throat. I watched them do that. And I'll cut your throat open, they'd say. I grew up in that. I grew up smelling urine, smelling puke. I grew up smelling all that goes along with drunks. That's how I was raised. I didn't know a whole lot about love. I had a grandfather that tucked me in bed at night. I fell in love with that little girl sitting back there in the back. And I've been in love with her since 1966. But a hard time, I had a hard time understanding the love of a father in heaven, how he would love me down on this earth. And that's something I know he saved me. I know I'm born again. I know my sins have been forgiven. I know that happened. But as far as understanding that love and feeling it in my soul and being comforted by it and getting power from it, the Bible said, perfect love casteth out fear. For the Bible said, fear hath torment. And so my friend, I said, Lord, I began to pray this. You see, I'm telling you one of these secret, okay? Will you listen to a secret? I want God to be glorified in here this morning. I want God to be glorified. Let me give you a secret. That secret is, in the first time in 36 years pastoring a church, and since 1973, when I got saved, I got in that closet and got on my face and began to get deeper and deeper and deeper and open up more and open up more with God and lay it out before Him. And I said to Him just the other day, I said, Lord, I know You love me. I know You do because Your Word says You do. But Lord, I want to feel it. And you know what He said to me? He said, don't get in a hurry, son. I'll lead you there. <laughs> I'll take you there. Everything that He's done for me has always been a journey. 
where he teaches me. He lets me understand it. He knows what he's doing. And I have full confidence in him this morning that in the due time, in his way, that I've begun to feel the great movement and force of that love. I know he loves me. I know he loves me. But I never had a father's love. So I have to experience first time in my life what a father's love is. And so when I look at the cross, I see a love letter. Our love is so finicky and superficial. We're in love one day and out of love the next day. Some of you ladies are going to have a husband that doesn't love you anymore. Some of you men are going to discover down the road where your wife has been texting someone or stepping out on you and it's going to break your heart. I've been around a while. I know how it goes. I've watched adultery. I've watched fornication. I've watched homes broken. I've listened to crying children. I see what it does. I see what it does to them for years coming down the road. I know what it does. There's nothing lovely about us. There's nothing worthy about us. There's no reason why he should love us. But the Bible said, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet unlovely, while we were corrupted and polluted in our own blood, when we were useless, worthless, he loved us. So what does that really mean, preacher? Look over here to Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are all killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you're a drunken fornicator, blasphemous, your mouth is as filthy as it can be, your heart is dark, you're proud and you're arrogant. Most people would shy away from you. They don't even want to be around you, but he loves you. You've been out here messing around on your wife. Let me tell you this, you can be sure your sin will find you out. He loves you. Are you a born again believer? Yes, I am preacher. Then he'll chasten you. And the chastening for the present won't seem good, but he will chasten you because he loves you. Lady, have you an affair going on? Are you on the internet? Do you have this little talking relationship which can lead to something much worse? There's a lot of things about the internet that have opened up Pandora's box, folks. Opened up the gates of hell. You say, I won't get caught, you'll get caught, but he loves you. It won't matter to you right now, but it will matter when all hell breaks out against you. I don't care if you were baptized when you were an infant. I don't care how many churches you belong to. And I don't care how many professions of faith you've made. I don't care how many times you've been led to the Lord. Do you know the one that I'm preaching about this morning? Enough to change your life. Because if your life has never changed, you've never met him. You know him up here, but you don't know him down here. But let me tell you something. This is not to condemn you. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. He sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the answer for every problem need you have. Respond to him today. I don't know who you are and who this was for, but you just heard a love letter from heaven. He bore your sin and sickness in his own body on the tree, took all of your filth and bore it in his body. The Bible said by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. He tasted your death. What's that mean? It means he tasted the way you would die without God. When you look into the dark, bleak eternity lost, and that terror settles in over your soul, when nobody can help you now, and you're about to go off into eternity, and you're not ready, he tasted death so that he could bear it in his own body on the tree so that he can take it from you and give you salvation in the name of Jesus.